intrusive reporting in, on the conflicts in Iraq and Afghanistan. Speaking of uh, Afghanistan, our uh, speaker today, uh, Ambassador Jonathan Adelton, is currently in Kandahar, where he is the senior civilian representative, but he is best known as one of the real American experts on Mongolia. He has come up through USAID, so he's uh, well known for, as an expert on economic development, and he has seen the evolution of Mongolia into now a very important uh, exporter of natural resources and a very important country in geopolitical terms. With that, Ambassador Adelton. No, thank you very much. I'll try to make this informal and try to have time for questions as well. But I do appreciate uh, from Hong Kong University Press, Michael Duckworth, and also Keith, thank you for that introduction. And thank you all for coming here. I think it does indicate a certain interest in Mongolia. Um, as was mentioned, I've been in Mongolia twice, uh, for three years each time. One was 2001 to 2004 as USAID country director, and then most recently from 2009 to 2012 as ambassador. Um, sometimes I would be asked in Mongolia where my interest came in Mongolia, and I'm not even sure I can give a right answer, but I do recall back in the day, and it was a long, long time ago, I graduated from college in 1979, my first job was as an editor at World Book Encyclopedia, and my, my, my family thought I owed it to them because I had been raised on World Book Encyclopedia, so I should uh, write a few articles for them. But when I finally had an income, I joined a history book club. I've always had this interest in history, too. And, uh, uh, you know, it's one of those book clubs that offers this great, you know, free first volume. And the first free volume, which is a, I still have to this day, was a wonderful edition of The Secret History. Uh, and so this was The Secret History of the Mongols, uh, you know, dating back to the times of Genghis Khan. So maybe that was part of it. And then I also think of my foreign service career, some of the places where I've lived, and again, I use this story in, um, in Mongolia as well, is that many, many of the assignments, and they're far flung across large amounts of space, but there was the imprint of the Mongols after all these years. So for example, I lived many, many years in Pakistan, and of course, you think of Lahore as one of the old Mughal cities. Um, currently living in Afghanistan, uh, Bamiyan was actually where Genghis Khan's favorite grandson was killed. And it's often said that he thought that Afghanistan was the country that, in terms of landscape, was most similar to Mongolia, and he, he liked that. Uh, served in Kazakhstan also for three years, and uh, Kazakhstan, of course, was uh, lots of toing and froing between east and west, and certainly the armies of, 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 of uh, Genghis Khan were all over, not just Kazakhstan, but the other stans where I worked in at the time as well. Even Cambodia, where I've served, I think the best written account of Angkor Wat at its height was actually from a traveler from the court of Kublai Khan. So I would even kind of draw that into the uh, orbit. And then the one that probably surprised people most was in Jordan, where I served for four years. I don't know if any of you have been to the Jordan, but if you go to Ajlan Castle north of, um, of Amman, you'll see a marker that says this was a victory of the Mamluks over the uh, Mongols. And as I understand it, in Mamluk history, it's treated as a great victory. And in Mongol history, it's treated as a minor cavalry skirmish. So. <laughs> I'm not sure which was which, but the fact is, Mongol horsemen got all the way to Ajlan Castle uh, in, 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 in the Middle East. Um, of course, uh, the, the, actually maybe I will mention this, I wasn't sure if it would or not, but the Mongols have left a lot of stories behind. One of them is told into Afghanistan for this day, and the reason why I'm reaching for my wallet here is because it is actually on the $1 note. I don't mention this in the book, but it's, um, you know, if you look at the U.S. symbol, you have the 13 arrows here. Um, they tell the story. It's actually an Afghan uh, school books I've been interested to read about. And, of course, in a, it's, it's, it's an interesting story about the importance of unity. And, of course, the story is that uh, Genghis Khan's, I think it was his mother, um, took the kids aside and, you know, the classic story about one arrow and you break, and then you put all the arrows together and they don't break. Um, well, I've been told that that story has been repeated in many cultures in many places. Certainly in Afghanistan over the years, they've talked about that story, and they read it in their textbooks. Sometimes they put other people to it. Um, but I've been told that even in colonial America, they read that story from the, in the 1700s about, um, about uh, Genghis Khan and the Mongols. And so that notion of unity uh, sort of made its way into our own history as well. Um, the book that just came out, and I've just seen it for my, the first time myself about 30 minutes ago, had its genesis last year when we celebrated the 25 years of U.S.-Mongolian relations. It was only in 1987, which is pretty late when you think about it, when we finally recognized each other and exchanged ambassadors and opened embassies. 
Um, the book itself, though, starts off in 1862, because as we were getting ready for that celebration, and it's always fun to be an ambassador in a place where you have a commemoration like that, um, I had some contact with the National Archives of Mongolia, and they produced a document for me which was really quite fascinating. It was a travel pass, and I say a travel pass, it was a travel pass about this long, written in, I don't read it, but it's Old Manchu script, although I'm told it was phonetic Mongolian, but they used the script, Old Manchu script. And basically, it gave permission for a Mr. Pelosi, or some people might translate it Pelosi, to travel from what was then Peking to St. Petersburg. Among other things in the note, it said that he, he could not accept or receive any bribes. So even back in the, uh, you know, 1862, they were talking about that. But the other remarkable thing is they have the note from the border post uh, that's also part of the National Archives, which basically says that this American and this Frenchman riding on camels, this is in the north going to St. Petersburg, approached. And at first they thought they were Mongolian, but then they realized they were from U.S. and North America, and they had a, a Mongolian travel with them. So last year when we observed the, 50th, uh, the 25th anniversary, I was also able to say it was the 150th anniversary of the first um, U.S. citizen, as far as I know. I'm waiting for a historian to find an earlier one. But I think this would be the documented proof that, America, that an American passed through Mongolia back in 1862. Uh, about five years later, they had a journalist, a guy by the name of Thomas Knox, who was a quite famous Civil War journalist from, I think it was either New Hampshire or Vermont. Um, and after the Civil War, he got a second career as a book of children's adventure stories. And he wrote, a, I think it's like 45 books or something like that. Uh, but in, in an old uh, magazine called Galaxy from 1868, he has his journey to outer Mongolia uh, article, about eight or ten pages, which is quite fascinating. And among other things, he said that uh, at that time, Mongolia was in some sense part of, of uh, the province of China. He did not think that would last long, uh, and he, he thought the hold was kind of tenuous. And he also used the expression that he thought that the uh, double-headed eagle would express interest, clearly referring to the uh, Tsarist Empire. So, you know, back in 1868, the journalist kind of got it right in terms of what was going to happen over the next 50 years. There were other early visitors. Um, uh, one of them was Herbert Hoover, who was a miner, uh, as you know, was a, a mining guy in China. He took some trips to Mongolia and had an, a, left an account of listening to records, uh, Russian records, in the home of the Bogod Khan uh, in the early 1900s, probably 1900, in uh, what was then Urga, later Ulaanbaatar. Um, and he also talked about him riding a bicycle around the, uh, the courtyard. I use that example in the book as a sort of a, a portent of things to come in terms of the international engagements that would increasingly become uh, part of what Mongolia was about. There was also a guy called Franz Larsen, who I don't think is known in the States. He's quite well known in Sweden. Uh, grew up in poverty as an orphan, uh, became a missionary, uh, went to Mongolia, actually married an American, and for the rest of his life had an American connection as well. Uh, during the Boxer Rebellion, led a group of missionaries across the Gobi Desert, uh, but later got into business. And a lot of those early encounters that, uh, that we get in the State Department were actually, Franz Larsen was the translator. I think a Swedish book has recently come out about, uh, about Franz Larsen, but he's an amazing guy. He lived, um, most of his work was in the late 1800s, early 1900s, although he continued to be involved into the 1930s, uh, but retired in uh, California in, I think, the 1950s. And what his daughter says is that, uh, to sort of, he, he always loved Mongolia. That was the place that he was all about. And I think even in his, he must have been in his 80s by then, that he always used to pick the winning horses at the local horse race, and he always used to watch the wrestling shows. So I kind of think even in his 50s, his mind was wandering back to, uh, to Mongolia back in the day. Um, you also had, of course, Roy Chapman Andrews. I don't know if you followed the events about the, um, the dinosaur bones that have come back. You had that court case in New York that were smuggled from Mongolia. Um, from the Mongolian perspective, I think uh, Roy Chapman Andrews is, is, is emerging as a, as a positive figure, although back in the day, the feeling was that you know, these kind of guys coming out were stealing their dinosaur bones and, and stealing their cultural heritage. Um, but he was a colorful guy and, and, and has left a legacy behind as well. Uh, later, Vice President Henry Wallace visited in 1944. We didn't have relations, but he did along Central Asia. This was the last year of the Second World War. People were beginning to wonder about what would happen post-World War II, and so he also visited. Um, but after the war, the... Um, uh, you know, basically there was a long silence. There were some academics such as Owen Lattimore, who you may have heard of, who got caught up in the McCarthy hearings and actually finished his career in the UK. But he was, he be, he was the first uh, American, indeed first Westerner, to become a member of the Mongolian Academy of Sciences. And he kind of kept the flame alive. And you had a few other academics that kind of kept interest in Mongolia going, although it was pretty, 
pretty modest. So the first chapter lays out some of these early connections. The second chapter gets into more of the diplomatic stuff. Um, it talks about the Declaration of Independence uh, uh, by the Bogut Khan, and he wrote a letter to nine countries asking for recognition in the newly independent, uh, or I call it the renewal of independence, because of course Mongolia had been independent for centuries and centuries. But um, he reached out, and the United States was one of the countries, and also included Netherlands and France and Britain, and I, I don't know which other countries. Um, and at the time, there were there were people in the embassy, uh, the U.S. embassy, or the legation as they called it, and what was then called Peking, that pressed for us to have at least in the consulate or some kind of presence in Ulaanbaatar, or Urga, as it as it, as it, as, it, as they called it. Um, but in the end, it didn't happen. The closest we came was to have a consulate in Kalgan. You guys will know the more recent Chinese name for it, but it's sort of in Inner Mongolia, halfway between uh, uh, Peking and, and Urga, as it was then called. Uh, the railway line went up to there, and that was kind of their listening post. And it was there for, to report on, like, the mad the Bloody Baron and the, the Bolshevik takeover and stuff like that. I think that legation was, that, that consulate in Inner Mongolia was only there for a few years before it also um, was abandoned and basically. Uh, Mongolia, for those many decades, entered into the, uh, the, the Soviet, uh, the Soviet or orbit. Um, what happened after the war, uh, they had the referendum uh, for independence uh, for Mongolia, which China accepted. Um, uh, they were quite close to the Soviet Union for many years. There were periodic efforts, though, to reach out and uh, have recognition. One of the examples of this was that our Justice William Douglas from the U.S. Supreme Court paid a visit to Mongolia that was written up in National Geographic in 1962, and he went back and wrote an op-ed saying that we should have relations with Mongolia. Um, a number of journalists during that time came, sort of human interest stories that they would come out, and uh, I wish I remember the names. I'm, Harrison Salisbury was one of them, but if, if, if you look at uh, New York Times, a lot of, over the years, Time Magazine as well, the correspondents would come out, they would have an interview with the president, um, they would come back to the States, it would have a little bit of interest in Mongolia, and there would be talk about recognition. I think in the early years it didn't happen, partly because uh, you, know, you had the which China did you recognize issue, and um, basically uh, Taiwan had never accepted Mongolia as being independent, and so there would be pushback on that side. But I think that the other pushback came later when Moscow was less interested. So in those early years after the war, maybe it was more dynamics in the states, that meant we didn't have relations. In the later part, maybe it was more dynamics in, in Moscow. But be that as it may, finally in 1987, we did sign that agreement in, uh, in uh, Washington, D.C., which uh, set in motion exchange of ambassadors and um, uh, opening of embassies. I turned out, an embassy's, uh, an ambassador's typically in place for three years. I was the eighth U.S. ambassador to Mongolia, so you do the math, it pretty much fit within that 25-year uh, that 25 year uh, time frame. Um, the rest of the book and most of the book is really about the heart of that, what's happened over those last 25 years, uh, which is perhaps a bit more than people realize. Um, uh, it sort of has five, five different sections. One of them is the sort of diplomatic engagement and if you will, the, um, some of that manifested itself in those senior visits. Uh, some of that manifested in itself for uh, support for uh, democracy in, um, in uh, Mongolia over the years. Really in 1990, they became part of what was happening in Eastern Europe and, and went in their direction. I know some people in the room were there in the 1990s. I was not. My first visit was in 2001. Um, but I think what's remarkable over the years, um, I think every, every Mongolian president has had a meeting with our president from the White House. Uh, of course, George Bush did visit uh, Mongolia and more recently when I was there, Vice President Biden visited. Um, I think, I don't, I should know this, but most of the Secretary of States, uh, uh, certainly Secretary of State Baker and Albright and um, Hillary Clinton visited just a year ago. Uh, she also visited as First Lady. Um, I think in, in, in a sort of diplomatic way, I think these kinds of visits have affirmed an interest and support for Mongolia. And for a small country of three million people, it's been fairly regular that we've had these visits. I say regular, that's not every year, that's not even every two years, uh, but every, you know, during the administration, uh, you know, Mongolia matters, and, and it matters in the sense that uh, you have visitors from Mongolia come to Washington, and certainly in the other direction as well. Um, and I think a lot of this is 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 indeed um, linked to Mongolia's stated commitment to democracy. You recently they were they turned over their chairmanship of the Community of Democracies, but they had those meetings in Almaty just a couple of weeks ago, and that's sort of this was an initiative that I think was founded during Secretary of State Albright's time that continues. And uh, again, I think that that interest is partly about that, um, uh, 
you know, those choices on the on the democracy front, the the the, 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 the space that uh, Mongolians have to say their own views, to um, uh, to demonstrate about what's going on. And uh, uh, one of the things I say in the book is over time that Mongolians have indeed become more skeptical and cynical about international companies and uh, and the um, and the uh, and their own political system. But that's part of democracy too, is that give and take that takes place. And I think that uh, what's interesting about Mongolia is that you'll have the whole spectrum of views that are presented. And I think that's a mark of, uh, of a lively debate which comes in, in, in any country. Um, and again, what, what I'm talking about is just the events as I've seen them, especially the last 12 years that I've been involved. But even going back to the 90s, if you read the old um, comments and statements and stuff, it's, it's, it's a place where a lot of views are, are heard, and, and which I think is a, is, is a good thing. The second thing I'll try to move quickly here is, um, is development. Uh, the development phase at some point is going to come to an end. Uh, it's basic, and it has not been huge. I think uh, the annual aid budget, USAID budget, in that history of Mongolia is about $10 million a year, which is pretty modest indeed, although I would argue as an old-time aid guy that dollar for dollar it's hard to find a place where $10 million a year have been used as effectively as that. Um, you know, we were involved in some of the first initiatives of business development among the herders and some of the first uh, business uh, development related to the, um, we call it the GARE initiative, which is basically the recognition that herders were moving to the urban areas and around those cities, especially Ulaanbaatar, but also elsewhere, there was a vibrancy in those GARE districts that you could tap into in a business kind of way, so we were involved there. Probably the most interesting thing that we did uh, was on the financial front, and it's detailed in this book, and I'm glad that it is, because otherwise I think it'd be forgotten. Uh, but two of the, ba of the banks there would not exist without the work of USAID. One of them was called Cosbank, and one of them was called Conbank. I don't know if you visited either one of them. Cosbank is an entirely new bank that's got a lot of um, praise. It was a unification of a UNDP and a USAID non-formal banking effort. It's become one of the larger banks in uh, Mongolia. That's got an interesting story to tell. Conbank is also fascinating. It was a, um, the old agricultural bank of Mongolia that had a habit of, of becoming bankrupt after elections. And uh, this is a pattern that is repeated in many places around the world, and it's just how you easily give out credit. Well, USAID very unusually managed that bank for 30 months. We brought in a small management team. It included uh, a couple Americans, but included several Mongolians as well. And they basically turned around that bank, and they turned it around by operating it like a bank. Um, the aid invested about $3.8 million into that project, 30-month project for technical assistance. The bank was sold as I was leaving uh, to a Japanese-American consortium for $6.7 million. I tried to get Americans interested. Every time I went, I thought, this, you guys, this is, you know, of course we advertised, you know, but who cared about Mongolia back in the day? Uh, it was bought again by a Japanese-Mongolian uh, consortium. That bank is worth at least $100 million today. And um, the story, which is partly chronicled in a short way here, is, is a pretty amazing one, but I think it kind of, indicate some of the stuff that was happening in, in Mongolia. Um, the other aspect, the total US assistance to Mongolia over the 20 year period is about $500 million. About 250 million of that is USAID, again do the math, about 10 or 12 million dollars a year. And, the, and, and, and somewhat more than that is the Millennium Challenge Corporation, which is a five year program, which is coming to an end this fall, that has been involved in the road project and some health programs and some vocational training programs in some land titling and also a big, huge uh, energy project, including a, um, wind energy there as well. Um, but you know, the, the development one, as I say in the book, will hopefully be coming to an end in the coming years as Mongolia moves from a place of, um, of aid dependence. In the early 2000s, it was one of the most aid-dependent countries in the world. In fact, there's a UN report from, I think, 2001 that says it ranks among the top five aid-dependent countries, and there is no sign of it changing anytime soon. Well. 10 years later, or 12 years later, uh, the economy has moved from a $1 billion economy to a $10 billion economy. Uh, it's got the same amount of foreign aid, but because of that growth, it's about 3% of the economy rather than 30%. So it has made that kind of shift. And just parenthetically, back in the day, the budget, when I first arrived in 2001, 2004, the national budget was on the order of three or $400 million. And um, this year's budget, I believe, is more than $4 billion. And if you can imagine trying to run a country at $300 million a year, I mean, that's, that's a challenge, $350 million a year. So they're in a different place, and it's a lot of this economic growth, as we'll find out here, is mineral-driven. Um, but it's interesting to watch that transformation take place. 
On the economic front, um, it's a relatively short chapter, to be honest. The, uh, the sort of the, the U.S. part of the story, and this does concentrate on the U.S. Mongolian relations, is significant increases in, in, uh, in exports. When I arrived in 2009, that year we only had $40 million in U.S. exports to Mongolia. Um, the year I left, it was more than $300 million. So again, you had this rapid growth. Uh, that does not include the Boeing planes, which uh, you know, uh, uh, Mongolia is contracted for, but it does include a lot of Caterpillar equipment. Caterpillar's done very well there, GE as well, other companies. In terms of investment, although investment story in Mongolia, again, looking back to my first time arrived in 2001, you might have had a couple dozen million dollars of investment. Now it's measured in the billions. Um, the U.S. has not been a huge part of that investment. I think that for the, uh, for the future, I, I think for the relationship, I think any reasonable foreign policy relationship needs an economic component. Um, right now, in terms of the Western mines you hear about, it's more Australia and Canadian investment. Um, and then there's other investment from the neighbors as well. Um, I think that you know, from the perspective of a former ambassador, I think it would be good if we had more investment there. Um, at this point, there's some of it taking place, but I don't want to exaggerate how much, is, how, how much has happened there. Um, moving on very quickly, the, uh, there's a chapter on, uh, on security. And what that's mostly talking about is Mongolia's emergence as a peacekeeping nation, um, providing peacekeepers to, uh, under UN flag to some interesting places and also participating in a modest way in both uh, Afghanistan and Iraq, where they have sent uh, some soldiers. But the more interesting, bigger story is their interest. They have a, a standing army of around 12,000. If you put everybody in uniform, including the border guards, it might be 30,000. Uh, but basically, their commitment is to develop a 3,000-person brigade, very mobile, that could be deployed in, in, in foreign countries. And they have deployed. They've deployed in Sierra Leone. They've deployed in numbers in Chad. In Kosovo, in Darfur, I was able to see off a group going, a medical group going to Darfur, and I think uh, there's 800 Mongolian soldiers serving in South Sudan. So again, the concept is that uh, 3,000, uh, you know, person brigade, approximately half of whom would be deployed overseas at any one time, uh, and most of those are under the UN flag. Um, that has gotten a lot of international support. There's a sort of a peacekeeping training center outside Ulaanbaatar called Five Hills. Um, and that's had support from the neighbors as well. Uh, the, the China has left a uh, R and R place for the Mongolian soldiers when they come back to be with their families and recover and recuperate. And uh, for example, Russia provided the heavy equipment that was used for their Chad deployment. Um, so it's an interesting kind of thing. We, the United States, has been involved in this sort of peacekeeping uh, missions in terms of training a different kind of Mongolian army that could participate under the UN flag. Um, the final part that I talk about is the people to people programs, and I won't go into a lot, although that's the longest chapter. And it does talk about the growing educational ties, the Fulbright, the fact that many Mongolians are finding their own way to the United States. Um, it talks about uh, some of the cultural support. I don't know if anybody's been to Mongolia, but I was really proud of the first time they had a large grant for cultural preservation under what's called the Ambassador's Fund for Cultural Preservation, which has competed across the whole world. There were four projects that year. One was in Mogul Hunting Lodge in Pakistan. One was an Armenian church in Turkey. One was a archaeological site in Afghanistan. The fourth one was Amrabastan Monastery, which is one of the treasures of, uh, of Afghanistan, of, of um, Mongolia. It's where um, a guy called Zanabazar, who they talk about as being the Michelangelo of, of Mongolia, where he was. And so we're helping to preserve that. So that's a nice example. Um, and it also talks about the Mongolians living in the States. Uh, there's about 30,000 Mongolian citizens that live in the United States. Uh, the only number that would perhaps be more would be in Korea. Uh, but anyway, that's part of our engagement and people coming back and forth. And then finally, the Peace Corps, where we have 130 volunteers that live in some of the remote places that most remote places you can you know, almost find imaginable, uh, but some amazing experiences that come out of that. Um, I'm pretty much finished. I guess the, uh, the, the last chapter, which is, um, is looking ahead, it does talk at, at different points in the book about the so-called third neighbor policy, which is the Mongolian perspective that you have to have good relations with your nearest neighbors but you also want the three-dimensional foreign policy. So for that reason, you reach out to Korea, to Japan, to Australia, to Canada, to Europe, and the United States. And so in a sense, this book is about one of those third neighbors in the United States. Um, they've done it fairly successfully. There'll always be challenges, but they have gotten a good balance, and they do like to have different windows on the world, and that's what this third neighbor policy provides for them. In terms of the challenges, um, those have been enumerated, perhaps more in the press in the recent years. You can certainly see them. It's the challenges of a resource-rich economy, and what you look at that is, you know, some of the things they have to be aware of. One is, of course, the so-called Dutch disease, which has happened in many countries. 
uh, and concerns of that in Mongolia. But I think some of the lessons learned include the need for a more diverse economy, not just about minerals. It, it, it argues for trying to avoid those boom and bust cycles that such economies have. It underscores the importance of investments in education and infrastructure. Uh, it underscores concerns over inequality and poverty that have been raised. Um, and um, uh, it, I think about, it also underscores the, the concerns over corruption, which are always uh, at play when you have lots of money coming in quickly. Uh, and it underscores environmental concerns, which, uh, you know, Mongolia, one of its biggest assets is its environment. And I think there's a strong recognition that that needs to be preserved. Um, I think above all, it underscores the importance of governance uh, going forward. And that was, if, I, if there was a theme of my, uh, my time as ambassador and the engagements that we had, that's what we talked about. And I think one of the good things is that um, uh, you can talk very candidly about these issues in a very positive way. In my USAID hat, uh, we tried to give examples from other places. I know that uh, the World Bank also has sent um, uh, Mongolians to places like Botswana and Chile that are perceived as being mineral rich, but have been able to manage that transition in a more positive way. They've also looked at Canada and, uh, and North America. So um, I've been out of Mongolia for a year now, so don't ask me about current events because I probably won't be so helpful, uh, but I've had a long engagement and uh, it, to me it's an interesting country. Uh, it's got many, many challenges, uh, but it's also got a number of things right that I think it needs to be recognized for. So thank you. With that, I'd like to open the uh, floor for questions. Um, while you're, I've oh, got one right back here now. Please wait for the mic and introduce yourself. Thank you. Thank you very much. My name is Michael McDonough. Uh, what a, a very interesting and enlightening lecture, um, one punctuated with lots of details and information. So I think everybody here was very impressed with it. Um, could you talk a little bit about uh, the components of this sort of $10 billion economy, yet now what seems like $4 billion worth of public expenditures? Uh, what that sort of relates to, who that's coming from, um, and you know, how that sort of is relevant or not to USA, which sounds like such a small number. I know you mentioned Canada and Australia were the big uh, benefactors of these you know, private companies as well that are investing. Thank you. Yeah. I'm, I'm using these the figures broadly because I don't have them in front of me, but I know that uh, it's you know, roughly, roughly a billion when I arrived and a $10 billion coming when I left, and the sort of 30 to 40 percent of your GDP being your budget that's pretty typical for these countries. I, d I actually did look at those budget figures when I was writing the book. So, you know, I think it's uh, 370 or whatever it was at the time back in 2001, and this year it's more like 4 billion. Um, the, what, it, what it's done is, I mean, I think it's been driven by the mineral economy, no doubt about that. And, and by the ones that get the headlines are, are the, the, the big investments, Oya Tolgoy and, and uh, some of the big mines that involve the Rio Tentos or the Ivanhoe's or you know, Peabody's interested in or whatever. Those are the ones that get the headlines. But beyond that, there's actually quite a lot of other investment that's taking place um, that I think is, is just as important. And, 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 and frankly, as someone that thinks that the balance needs to be right between the environment and the business side, also needs to be looked at. Uh, and of course, Mongolia struggled with what is the best kind of uh, you know, laws to have, both investment and environment. But there's no doubt that that economic growth is driven by those investments. Although the big Oya Tolgoi, I don't believe has gotten the first dollar yet off exports itself. I mean, Mongolia has benefited from, from, from royalties and revenues and investment that comes with it. Um, but I think it's this fall that that copper and gold will start to be exported and which will have another income stream for, uh, you know, for Mongolia going forward. Um, but again, the growth is clearly mineral driven. Uh, it has given the government more money than ever before. Uh, some of that money has gone into uh, social payments, if you will, and some of these have been controversial, although there's also a sense that a small country, you have to, citizens have to perceive that they're benefiting from that, so that's part of it. Um, but they've also gone into certain kinds of investments, infrastructure. Uh, literacy is still as high as it was when the Soviets left. Uh, the health system is better. The, the, um, the um, uh, life expectancy is bigger. Uh, the immuniz immunization coverage. So they put money into these kinds of things. Um, uh, but I think actually the bigger investments are yet to come. If these mining investments pay off, if it does result in a stream of stuff for the future, they will, you will see them put more into, um, uh, into infrastructure, especially the roads, the power. They haven't had, an, even with all this economy, they really haven't had a new big, huge power plant in 20 years. And I think that's one thing that they need and they'll look for. So I think that those infrastructure investments will 
you know, will, will, will increase. And there's a lot they want to do. I mean, to bring a big country together, whether it's roads. We were talking before about railways. I don't know how much ink's been spilled on railways in Mongolia. The fact of the matter is, I doubt if there's been a kilometer more railway than there was 20 years ago. That'll happen at some point. Uh, it hasn't quite happened yet, though. How well defined are Mongolia's northern and southern borders? I mean, in the last year, we've seen the incident with Chinese troops camping on in the area in an area that uh, both India and China claimed. We've seen all these atolls become issues uh, in the South China East China Sea. Uh, it goes through a sparsely populated area. Any islands and streams or anything that's a danger there? Um, as far as I know, that there are no territorial disputes. Uh, the border is demarcated. Uh, you know, it was demarcated during Soviet times. It was demarcated with China as well. Um, like I said, China has accepted the uh, independence through that referendum. Um, I think Mongolia is fortunate in that sense that the borders are demarcated. And um, uh, again, as far as I know, that there's no, and, and, you know, many, many countries have these, these pressing kinds of issues. In Mongolia, that's one thing that is not at play. Okay. Uh, Tara? Uh, it's interesting, Ambassador, you talk in the beginning of your book and your talk of a rather romantic notion of a beautiful country, and then by the end, with development, there's the rich-poor gap, there's environmental degradation, uh, concerns about corruption. It doesn't sound like it's leading to a very happy place in terms of its development. Can that be fixed? Is there really hope that it's going to get better? Because particularly in terms of the rich-poor gap, it, it seems pretty intense. Right. Um, well, a couple of things to say about that. The, um, one of the things I say in the book is that Mongolia is a kind of country where people do project their own myths and fantasies. And I'm guilty of that with anybody else. I don't know if any of you, I think some of you have been to Mongolia, but if you're out in the steppe, dozens, maybe hundreds of miles, I, I, took, I once took a trip in Mongolia in 2003, I guess. I think we went 300 kilometers and didn't see a single living soul. And there's not that many places on this earth that can happen. Uh, and, you know, just the herding culture, you spend time there. Uh, and you, you, your, your romantic tendencies do tend to take over about what a beautiful and wonderful place it is, and it is. There's no doubt about that. And I think Mongolians are rightfully proud of their heritage. Um, at the same time, it's different if you're a kid growing up in one of those little provincial or even district towns. A provincial town, by the way, may have seven or 8,000 people, or, or 10 or 12,000 as a provincial capital. So they're really small towns. And you, know, you can see if you're a kid growing up, uh, that uh, the lights of Ulaanbaatar or even further afield Seoul or Los Angeles or somewhere else might, uh, might seem pretty attractive. Um, I, one of the things I say in there is that Mongolia in the future, it, it could perhaps be like a place like Australia where the ethos of the outback is important in forming what the country is about, but that doesn't mean everybody lives in the countryside because it's a tough life. I mean, to be a herder is one of the toughest things on earth. And you'll see Mongolians talk about that as well, that it's over-romanticized, it's tough to be so many miles away from medical care and, and, and everything else. In terms of the, of the, um, of the, of the mining, how, or I guess maybe the poverty first, um, I've always been a little bit skeptical about poverty figures, but in any case, the, the official ones sort of in recent years have moved from 40% to 27%, and so they're certainly heading in the right direction. You'll still see the 40% all over the place, but if you look at uh, the most recent articles and what they've been trying to do, they've had, they've had sort of different ways of measuring it. Uh, but the most recent World Bank, you know, study on this posits 27 percent. Um, I think you can't do this by anecdote, but if you've if you've lived there over the years, you can see the country's changing. I didn't mention in terms of the budgets, but just in my recollection of visiting small district offices in 2001 and visiting them 12 years later, uh, and these are, you know, these are government budgets that are funding these things. It's just a huge difference in terms of what's available. Um, again, the, uh, I, I think in, the, in, the, in some of those figures, the, the fact that the, um, uh, the health figures, the education figures, um, these have not declined over the years. And I think that the fact that uh, it's almost universal literacy, uh, the role of the woman in that society, um, if, there's, if there's some hope going forward, I think some of that dynamic's gonna put them in a, in, in a better place. Um, the foreign investments are gonna always be controversial, as I think is understandable. Uh, they do have, you know, significant parts of the country that are set aside, you know, for preservation, if you will. And I think the, how that actually happens is going to be a big challenge. Um, I guess I can only leave it as, as a challenge. I don't think, necessarily think it's a road downhill. I think that they've gotten the balance right in some places. Um, I also think that some of the Western commentary um, kind of reflects what I referred to as projecting my own myths and fantasies. 
I do my share of that. Uh, but if you're a Mongolian, you know, that next chapter is, is the one you write, it's the one your children write, and that's the one that matters more than anything. And the Mongolians are certainly aware of those issues that you talked about. I guess the other quote I have in there is this uh, Zorik, who is the politician that some of you may know about, was killed in the 1990s. And I, I, I end the chapter on democracy in that, where he writes to his sister in Prague and says, at the end of the day, I'll trust the wisdom of the Mongolian people. And uh, this was during a time when there was a lot of enthusiasm for democracy, and there still is in some ways. I think I mentioned to somebody that even in those huge, tough years in the 90s and early 2000s, you pull Mongolians, 90% said they did the right thing in terms of making their choice for democracy. 80% said they made the right choice in pursuing a market economy. And those figures lasted longer in Mongolia than in many of the, of the, of the post-Soviet countries. So I think all that adds together, you know, they will never reach the point where they say, we've solved it, we've done it, we're in an okay place. They're gonna always be facing difficulties. I've sometimes made the quote that uh, for Mongolia, the, the more successful they are, the harder it gets. So those challenges are gonna always be there. That's gonna define their politics. Uh, but I think that they can do it right. What they do have is um, you know, assets they've never had before to do some kinds of investments, whether it's health, education, infrastructure, or whatever. That was a bit long of an answer, but I hope I touched on some of those themes. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Hi, thank you. Thank you for a great presentation. Uh, my question is, if you could give us some color on, you know, what the relationship um, within the political bureaucracy um, is between China and Mongolia, because I think that relationship is so key now. A lot of exports, 90% plus, goes to China, and uh, I'm I'm just wondering. One more question, yeah. And over here. Yep. The, the one answer. For right. Yeah. That's good. Um, it's following up on your democracy point, I was curious, given the socioeconomic history you described, where does the current leadership look in terms of inspiration for their political development? Do they want to be a Western democracy? Do they want input from the US and Europe? Uh, or do they want to do something on their own? Or are they looking at their neighbors for how they've driven their political development? Okay. I think my question is related to China. Uh, about <coughs> Chinese investment, so exactly how high the anti-China sentiment is in the country? Yeah, let me, uh, I, I guess start, I'll try to do it very quickly here, but the, um, uh, the first one on sort of e examples, I mean, I think that they want to associate themselves as a democracy very um, strongly. I think President Albert George, when he became president, his first trip was to India. And I think he was making the point, we're an Asian democracy. Um, it's a little, little known, but uh, Sun, Sun, Sun Tzu Chi's hus, late husband studied in Mongolia, and she visited recently for the um, uh, for the uh, community democracies meeting, and, and they consciously kind of like those examples of, of, of countries that have made a similar kinds of, of steps. Uh, so you know, Burma is certainly certainly very much on Myanmar, Myanmar is certainly very much on the uh, on the radar screen there. Um, at the same time, I think they would associate themselves with. The Western democracies, if you will, uh, you know, the, what they mention is they mention specifically when I've had all my conversations, uh, third neighbors. Uh, once I just said third neighbors was the rest of the world, and and one of the people in the foreign ministry said, no, that's not the case. The third neighbors are other democracies in the world, and that's when they listed Korea, Japan, Australia, Canada, United States, and Europe. Um, uh, but again, I think in terms of reach, oh, India is on that list as well. So I think in those terms they do that. The questions on China, you know. I'll be honest and say, I never got a good understanding of what the Chinese investment was, or for that matter, the Chinese aid program, because they've been involved, uh, but they have not been involved at the level of exchange of information or the donor forums or stuff like that. So I know that at different times, China's had an aid program, uh, but there's no visibility on it. And in terms of investment, I just, I don't know. Um, I think it's large. Um, I've been to a lot of mines, and they would say, oh, well, that's the Chinese investment there. Uh, but I just, honestly, I don't know. Um, in terms of the sort of the more diplomatic relations, I guess I, 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 I don't want to be in a position to comment on relations between other countries where I'm not serving yet. I think it's probably best you know, not to go there. But I think that the, the important thing is that if, if, if I could characterize the way the Mongolia looks at the world is they acknowledge and recognize their history and the importance of good relations with neighbors. That's, they'll say that's the foundation of their foreign policy. But they will also say that we want 
three-dimensional relations. We don't want one or two-dimensional relations with the world. We want three-dimensional relations. And that leads into the whole um, third neighbor view, which is they welcome, and again, my book concentrates just on the US, uh, but you have to put that in the context of a lot of other third neighbor relations that are a part of that. Uh, that's what they want. They want those good immediate relations, but they also want good relations further afield. Thank you very much indeed. We always like to give our guests something to remember the club by Ambassador Adel. Thank you very much. Thank you, very much. Thank you all for coming. We hope to see you at uh, one or more of our events next week as well. Thank you.